right, we'll go ahead and start with problem number one, where you're given the quadratic function f of x equal to x squared minus 2x minus 3. And you are to perform the following. And pretty much it's going to be laid out like this, where you're going to, in part A, determine whether the graph opens upward or downward. Part B, identify the vertex of the parabola. Part C, find the x-intercepts. Part D, find the y-intercept. And part E, sketch the graph using the intercepts, vertex, and additional points. Okay, so... All right, so here we have in problem number one, the function f of x is equal to x squared minus 2x minus 3. And in part A, we want to determine whether the parabola opens upward or downward. That means we need to identify the A, which is the coefficient of the x squared term, since it's in general form. And if A is positive, that means the parabola opens upward, or if A is negative, it opens downward. So what would A have to be here? One. Now, based on that, will the parabola open upward or downward? Upward, because your A is positive. So that tells you that the parabola is going to be opening upward when we graph this. All right, and that's all for part A. Now, part B is to find the vertex of the parabola. And I might as well add this as well, the axis of symmetry. So that means we need, we need to identify the A and the B since it's in general form. We already identified A, which is 1. Your B is the coefficient of your x term. What's the coefficient of x? Negative 2. So here A is 1 and B is negative 2. So to find the x-coordinate of the vertex, we're going to be using x equal negative B divided by 2A. And then we substitute the A and the B in this expression here bring over the negative, and then replace the b with negative 2, divided by 2 times a, which is 1. And then to simplify this, negative of negative 2 would be 2, divided by 2 times 1, which is 2, and then 2 divided by 2 is 1. So the x-coordinate of that vertex will be 1. And now to find the y-coordinate of that vertex. To find the y-coordinate of the vertex, we take that x equals 1 and substitute it for every x in this f of x function. So here we're going to evaluate f of 1. So x squared, that x will be 1, so it will be 1 squared minus 2 times x, which is 1, minus 3 and then simplify. So here 1 squared will be 1 minus 2 times 1, which is 2, minus 3. Now what's 1 minus 2 minus 3? In negative 4. So that negative 4 is your y-coordinate of that vertex. So the vertex of that problem would be the ordered pair, 1, negative 4. Now, the axis of symmetry is that vertical dotted line going through the x-axis at that x value. So the axis of symmetry would be x is equal to what? Has to be x equals 1. We can get that from the x-coordinate of the vertex. Now, on the exam, make sure that you do write x equal to whatever the x-coordinate of the vertex is, because Axis of symmetry represents a vertical dotted line. And the equation for a vertical line is x is equal to that constant, or the x-coordinate of that vertex. All right, are there any questions about part B? 
I part C is finding the x-intercepts. So anytime you're finding the x-intercept, you always set that function f of x equal to zero. And here f of x is going to be that x squared minus 2x minus 3. And you'll set that equal to zero. And then we just uh, factor x squared minus 2x minus 3 if we can. And I believe we can do that in, by setting this up as two binomials here. x squared breaks up as x and x. Now I need factors of a negative 3 that would give me minus 2x as a middle term. That would have to be, no, it has to be 3 and 1. But the larger of these two factors will get the sign of that middle term. Here, 3 is the larger of the 2, and it will be a minus. That would mean the 1 will have to be plus. So in this case here, we got x minus 3 times x plus 1 equal to 0. Now we can set each binomial factor equal to 0. So this means x minus 3 is equal to 0, and x plus 1 equals 0. And for each equation, we're going to solve for x. So for the x minus 3 equal to 0, that means x is equal to 3. And then for the x plus 1 equal to 0, that means x is equal to negative 1. So here we have two x-intercepts. And that's going to be the ordered pair 3, 0 and negative 1, 0. Okay, so that means that the problem is going to be crossing the x-axis at the ordered pair 3, 0 and negative 1, 0. All right, questions on part C. All right, now part D is finding the y-intercept. Now when you find the y-intercept, you substitute every x in this function with 0. So we're going to be evaluating f of 0. So we replace the x with 0, so it will be 0 squared minus 2 times x, which is 0, minus 3. This is 0, minus 2 times 0 is 0. 0 minus 0 minus 3 ends up being negative 3. So the y-intercept would be the ordered pair 0, negative 3. Okay. Any questions about part D? All right, now part E is to sketch the graph using your intercepts or vertex in any additional points. Now, on the exam, you will have coordinate grids to use to graph your uh, functions. All right, so first of all, let's graph the uh, vertex, which is uh, 1, negative 4. So go to the right one and down, 4. And then my axis of symmetry is x is equal to 1. So here, this is going to be that vertical dotted line going through the x-axis at 1. And then I have my x-intercepts are 3, 0, and negative 1, 0. So 3, 0, I go to the right 3. That's on the x-axis. 
and then negative 1, 0 go to the left 1 also on the x-axis. The y-intercept is the ordered pair 0, negative 3, so I stay at 0 but go down to negative 3. Now here's where I get my additional point. If I compare the distance from this y-intercept to the uh, axis of symmetry, that distance is one place to the left. So that means that the ordered pair that's on the opposite side will have to be one place to the right with that same y-coordinate. So it will be here. In this case, it's going to be 2, negative 3. Now, these are all the points that I'm going to need to make the graph of this parabola. All right, so this is what the graph of the parabola f of x equal to x squared minus 2x minus 3 looks like. Okay. Are there any questions about uh, problem number 1? Using that five-step procedure to graph a parabola. Okay, problem number two is this. Here you're given the quadratic uh, function f of x equal negative 4x squared plus 160x minus 600. And you want to perform the following. Part A is to determine without graphing whether the function has a minimum value or a maximum value. And then part B, find the minimum or maximum value and determine where it occurs. And then part C, identify the function's domain and range. Okay, so that's what we'll do here. Start off with f of x is equal to negative 4x squared plus 160x minus 600. All right, so first of all, let's determine whether this function has a maximum or a minimum value. So here we identify what A is. What's the A in this case? Negative 4, that's the coefficient of your x squared term. Now, will we have a maximum or a minimum value? It's a maximum because your A is negative. Now, if A was positive, then, it, then you would have a minimum value. So, in this case, you have a maximum value. So, with part A, all you have to do is uh, identify what A is and tell me whether you have a maximum or a minimum value. Part B, since we know we have a maximum value, we're going to find out what that is and where it occurs. So we already know what A is. That's negative 4. So what's B? What's the B in this case? 160. That's the coefficient of your X term. All right. So to find out where it occurs, we use X equal negative b divided by 2a. Excuse me. <coughs> All right, now, here we substitute the a and the b in this expression here. Bring the negative over, replace the b with 160, over 2 times a, which is negative 4. So here I got negative 160 in the numerator. 2 times a negative 4 is negative 8. And what's negative 160 divided by negative 8? It'd be 20. So the maximum occurs when x is equal to 20. Now, to find the maximum value, we substitute the x in this function with 20. 
and simplify. So it would be negative 4 times x, which is 20, and that's squared, plus 160 times x, which is 20, minus 600. And then we just simplify here. And here you can use the graphing calculator to type all of this in. So we can type in negative 4, and then left parentheses, 20, close parentheses, and then hit the x squared key to square it. Plus 160, left parentheses, 20, close parentheses, minus 600. And you should end up with 1,000. So that means that the maximum value is 1,000, and it occurs when x is equal to 20. Any questions on part B? Now, part C is to identify the function's domain and range. Now, the domain is quite easy because we have a quadratic function, which falls under the category of polynomial functions, meaning any x value that you assign to it, you're always going to get a value for f of x. And it does have no restrictions here on the x here. So from negative infinity to infinity will be your domain. Now for the range, we're looking at the set of all y values here. And we have a maximum value. So that means here, if you look at part B, we have 1,000, which is our maximum value. That's the highest y value it would ever be. So that range will have to be from negative infinity up to 1,000. And we use the bracket around the 1,000 because that's the highest y value it would ever reach. Now, if it was a minimum value, then you have to list the minimum value and then positive infinity. Because with the minimum value, you're going to have the lowest y value that it, it would ever be. All right, questions on problem number two. All right, problem number three is using the leading coefficient test. So here we're going to be using the leading coefficient test to determine the end behavior of each polynomial function. So in part A, we got f of x equal to x to the fifth plus 17x cubed minus 11. Now, the way we uh, determine the uh, end behavior, we have to first identify n and also identify a sub n. n is the highest exponent in that polynomial function. So what would be the highest exponent for this one? 5. And your a sub n represents a leading coefficient. That's the coefficient of the variable to the highest power. So what would be the coefficient of the variable to the highest power? One. All right. Now we determine whether n is even or odd, and then a sub n, either positive or negative, for the n, which is five. Is that even or odd? That's odd, an odd number. A sub n is one, positive or negative? Positive. All right. So now if we were to use that leading coefficient test that I'm going to pull up here, 
make sure you put this on your one page sheet of notes. As you can see here, n is odd. A sub n is greater than zero. That means it's positive. So this is your n behavior right here. The graph of f of x falls to the left and rises to the right. So here's our n behavior. f of x falls to the left and rises to the right. And some people like to use those arrows to, to show that the graph falls to the left and rises to the right. Are there any questions about part A? Now, part B, we have negative x to the 6 plus 7x cubed plus 2x squared minus 8x minus 12. And again, I'm going to use the uh, end behavior, well, the leading coefficient test to find out what the end behavior is. So we need to know what n is and what a sub n is. What's the n in this case? It's 6. That's the highest exponent in that polynomial function. What about a sub n? This time, negative 1. Highest exponent is 6. This co leading coefficient will have to be negative 1. Now, is n positive or negative? I mean, even or odd? It's even. What about the a sub n, positive or negative? It's negative. So going back to that leading coefficient test, here n is even. But this time, your a sub n is less than 0. That's negative. So this will be the n behavior. The function f of x falls to the left and to the right. Okay, So we can write that f of x falls to the left and to the right. Are there any questions about problem number three? So make sure you have that entire leading coefficient test on your one-page sheet of notes because you never know what type of problem I'm going to give you. And the end behavior might not be the same for those problems as they are here on this study sheet. All right, number four. Here we're going to find the zeros of this polynomial function f of x equals 3 times the quantity x minus 2, and that's squared, times x plus 5, that quantity is cubed. And give the multiplicity for each zero, and then state whether the graph crosses the x-axis or touches the x-axis and turns around at each zero. All right, now here you are given a function that's already factored completely. So here's what we're going to do. When we find the zeros, we always set the function f of x to be equal to zero. So here my f of x is three times the quantity x minus two and that's squared, times the quantity x plus 5 cubed 
equal to zero. Now since it's already factored completely, we're going to set each factor equal to zero and solve for x. So that means we set 3 to be equal to 0. We set x minus 2, quantity squared, to be equal to 0. And x plus 5, quantity cubed, to be equal to 0. Well, 3 equal to 0 is a false statement, so we can cross out that, cross that out. Now, for the x minus 2, quantity squared is equal to 0. What's the opposite of square in something? Square root. So we're going to take the square root on both sides. So the square root of x minus 2 quantity squared would be x minus 2 equal square root of 0 is 0. And now to get x by itself, I need to add 2 to both sides. So that means x equals 2. That's one of my zeros of this function. Now for the x plus 5 quantity cubed equal to 0, what would be the opposite of cubing something? Take the cube root on both sides. So that means I have x plus 5 is equal to 0. Then subtract 5. x equals negative 5. So x equals 2 and x equals negative 5 are the zeros of this polynomial function. Now we need to state each of their multiplicities and find out what their behavior is at each of those zeros. Starting with x is equal to 2. All right, in this case here, x equals 2 came from x minus 2 quantity square. What's the exponent there? 2. That tells you what your multiplicity is. So x equals 2 has a multiplicity of 2. Now for x equal negative 5, That came from the x plus 5. What's its exponent? 3. So that means that x equals negative 5 has a multiplicity of 3. Now let's find out what's happening at each of those zeros, starting with x equals 2. It has a multiplicity of 2. Is that even or odd? Even multiplicity. With even multiplicity, that tells you that the graph of that function, f of x, touches the x-axis and turns around. Okay. So a zero with even multiplicity tells you that to graph that function at that zero will turn, will touch the x-axis and turn around. Now for x equal negative five, that has a multiplicity of three. Is that even or odd? In this case, it's odd. So that means here, for a zero with odd multiplicity, the graph of f of x crosses the x-axis. So with an odd multiple, a zero with odd multiplicity to graph that function, simply cross the x-axis. <coughs> All right, are there any questions about problem number four? All right, problem number five deals with a graph of a rational function.
And in problem number five, you're to follow the seven steps to graph the rational function f of x is equal to 4x squared divided by x squared minus 9. Okay. f of x equal to 4x squared divided by x squared minus 9. And we're going to use that seven-step uh, procedure to graph that uh, rational function. Okay, first step. You want to determine whether the graph has symmetry. Whether it's uh, y-axis symmetry or origin symmetry, sometimes no symmetry. And to determine that, you just substitute every x with negative x. So we're going to evaluate f of negative x. So this will be 4 times, replace the x with negative x, now be squared, divided by, replace the x again with negative x, that 2 will be squared, minus 9. And then, simplify. You're squaring the negative, so that's going to end up being positive, so that's going to be 4x squared, divided by, negative x again, squaring it would be x squared, minus 9. Now compare what I got with f of negative x with the original function. Are they the same? And in this case, they are. So that means that the graph of this function will be symmetric with respect to the y-axis. So on the exam, not only are you going to work it out, but do tell me what type of symmetry you're going to have. All right, so that's step number one. Number two is finding the y-intercept. And to find the y-intercept, you always substitute 0 in for x, so you're going to be evaluating f of 0. So this will be 4 times x, which is 0, and that's squared, divided by x squared. Well, x is 0, and that's going to be squared, minus 9. All right, 0 squared is 0 times the 4 is 0. 0 squared again is 0 minus 9, which is negative 9. What's 0 divided by negative 9? zero. How often do I see someone say zero divided by negative nine is negative nine? That is not the, that is not so. So my y-intercept is going to be the ordered pair zero zero. So it's going to be crossing the origin. All right, problem part three or step number three is finding the x-intercept. So to find the x-intercept, you take your numerator, which is 4x squared, and set that equal to 0. And then divide both sides by 4. x squared is equal to 0. What is the only number squared that would give you 0? Of course, that has to be 0. So the x-intercept is also 0, 0. All right. So that's step number three. Now step number four is finding the vertical asymptotes. Now, to find your vertical asymptotes, you want to make sure that there are no uh, common factors in that function. So let's find out if there are any. 
that numerator is just going to be 4x squared. Can't simplify that any further. We can factor x squared minus 9 into what? x plus 3 times x minus 3. And as you can see here, there are no common factors to divide out, so we're okay with that. Now we can set that denominator, which is the which this right here, equal to 0. So I can set x plus 3 times x minus 3 to be equal to 0. And then solve for x. So that means x plus 3 is equal to 0. x minus 3 is equal to 0. And each equation will solve for x. So for the x plus 3 equal to 0, that means x is equal to negative 3. And then for the x minus 3 is equal to 0, that means x is equal to 3. So my two vertical asymptotes are going to be at x equal negative 3 and x equals positive 3. Okay, so I'm going to have two vertical dotted lines going through the x-axis at those two x values here. So that's step number four. Step number five is locating the horizontal asymptote. Now, this is where we identify the N and the M. The N is the highest exponent in the numerator. Your M is the highest exponent in the denominator for that function. So for N, what would be my highest exponent? It's 2. The M is the highest exponent in the denominator. What would that be? 2. Now, let's compare N and M. Is N... Greater than, less than, or equal to m? Equal to. And as for what I gave you back in section uh, 3.5, the notes, if n is equal to n, that means n is equal to m, that means you look at your leading coefficients in the numerator and the denominator. A sub n and B sub m are your leading coefficients in the numerator and denominator, respectively. So, what would be the leading coefficient in the numerator? 4. And what would be your leading coefficient in the denominator? 1. So, 4 divided by 1 would be 4. So, that means that the line, the horizontal line, y equal 4, would be your horizontal asymptote. Okay, that's step number five. Now, six and seven I'm going to do together. Because in step six is the table, and step number seven is the graph. And again, you'll have coordinate grids on your uh, exam. All right, now, let's go ahead and grab what we already have. We already got the y-intercept and the x-intercept which is going to be the origin, 0, 0. Uh, we do have vertical asymptotes. We have a couple of them. One will be at x equal negative 3. I'll draw that in. And the other one is at x equals positive 3.
And then we got the horizontal asymptote of y is equal to 4. That would be the horizontal dotted line going through the y-axis at 4. So I have my asymptotes in. Now I need to pick points to the left and to the right of each vertical asymptote and the x-intercept. So in this case here, uh, my first vertical asymptote is at x equal negative 3. Let me select x values like x equal negative 6, negative 5, and negative 4. The other one would be from negative 2 to negative 1. My x-intercept is at 0, so I'll pick x equals, oops, I made a mistake here. That should be at x equal 3. All right. So negative 1 and 2, I mean 1 and 2 would be my other x, and, I mean x values that I'll choose. My vertical asymptote is at x equal 3. So I pick x equals 4, 5, and 6. All right, and then the next step would be to uh, use my graphing calculator to come up with my f of x values here. All right, so let me go and give you the keystrokes for that. So to enter that function in the calculator, you want to do this. For the numerator, I'm going to use parentheses, so it'll be left parentheses, and then type in the number 4 xt theta n for the x, and then x squared to square the x, and then close parentheses. And then that would be divided by, the denominator needs to be in parentheses, so left parentheses, you type, press the xt theta n to get the x, then press the x square button to square that x, minus and then number nine, close parentheses. And then you get your table, of course, second and graph. Because right above that is the word table. All right, so now, here we go to y equal 2, and I'm going to clear this out. And then you're going to do left parentheses, 4, x c theta n for the x, and then x squared is squared, close parentheses. Divided by, and then left parentheses. For the x, you have to press x c theta n for that x, and then hit your x squared button to square it minus 9, close parentheses. And then for the table, you'll do second table, or second graph to get the table. And don't worry about trying to write, put these in fractions, because uh, on the exam, you can just use decimal values here. I'm okay with that. So like, let's say for x equal negative 6, to one decimal place, that's approximately 5.3. And then for negative 5, I'll use that 6.25 because I know 0.25 is, six and a, is 1 quarter or 1 fourth. For negative 4, that's going to be a positive 9.1 approximately. At negative 3, that's my, other, that's my first vertical asymptote. At negative 2, that's going to be negative 3.2. And then for negative 1, that's negative 0 0.5. 0, 0 is the x and the y intercept. I'm going to use my down arrow key. So for negative 1, that's negative 0 
0.5, negative 0 0.5. You can pretty much see that negative 1 and positive 1 have the same f of x value. That tells you that uh, this graph is symmetric with respect to the y-axis. At 2 is negative 3.2. At 4, well, at 3, that's my other vertical asymptote. But at 4 is 9.1. And at 5 is 6.25. And at 6, approximately 5.3. Now we can go ahead and plot those on the coordinate plane. So in this case here, for negative 6 and 5.3 will be to the left 6 and up 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and about a third of the way, about right here. And then negative 5 and 6.25 will be to the left 5 and up 6 and about one-fourth of the way, approximately right here. And negative 4 and 9.1 is 9 and about a tenth of the way. So I know what one part of the graph will look like. If I get closer and closer to this vertical asymptote, this graph will get closer and closer to it, but it will never touch it. If I go further to the left, it's going to get closer to the horizontal asymptote, but it will never touch it. Okay. Now for negative 2 or negative 3.2, to the left two and down three and about two tenths of the way about right here negative one and negative 0.5 to the left one and down halfway between zero and negative one and then for one and negative 0.5 to the right one and down halfway between zero and negative one and then for two negative 3.2 to the right two this two right here 3.2 about right here, and that's negative. So you can see that the left side has the mirror image of the right side. On the left of zero, it's going to come down, approaching that first vertical asymptote. To the right of zero, it's going to come down this way, approaching the second vertical asymptote. But it'll never touch. And then finally, that last part will have the mirror image of this part right here. 4 and 9.1 will be here. 5 and 6 and a quarter. About right here. And then finally 6 and 5.3 or about 5 and a third. So if I get closer and closer to that second vertical asymptote coming this way, it'll approach it, but it'll never cross it. Go Further to the right, it approaches that horizontal asymptote, but never cross it as well. So all of this represents the graph of the function f of x equal to 4x squared divided by x squared minus 9. Okay. Are there any questions about uh, problem number 5? Oh, can I get these numbers, those x values? First of all, I've graphed in the uh, x and the, I mean the vertical asymptote and the horizontal asymptote and those x axes. I just pick points to the left and to the right of each vertical asymptote and the x intercept. So with this being x equal negative 3, I use negative 6, negative 5, and negative 2. There are no set number of values that you can use, but you want to use enough of them to. Uh, so that way you can get an idea of what that graph is going to look like. Any other questions? Okay, problem number six. Through 13 deals with chapter four. Mainly four one and four two. And then number six, you're to approximate each uh, number using a calculator and round your answer to three decimal places. So in part A, let's say you had this. Three to the 2.4 power. 
and we want to get an approximate uh, value to three decimal places. So in this case here, I'll give you the keystrokes here. You'll, ty you'll type in the number three, press the hat key, and then 2.4, press enter. this, type in the number 3, press the hat key, and then 2.4, and then press enter. So what would this amount be to uh, three decimal places? Okay, 13.967. Questions on part A. All right, part B. Let's say we got e to the 3.4. e to the 3.4 power. Now, there are two ways you can get the e. One of them is just pressing the second key and then press the LN key, because right above the LN key is e to the x. And then go ahead and type in your exponent of 3.4 and then press enter. So if I did it this way, second LN and then 3.4, hit enter, what would this amount be to three decimal places? Okay. So what I have here is one way, or you could do it this way. Press the second key, uh, then press the division key, because right above that division key is the letter E. But then you'll have to press the hat key for your exponent then 3.4 and enter. So if I did this way, second and division for the E, then you have to press your hat key, 3.4. You'll still get Any question about uh, problem number six, A and B? All right, number seven. Are your compound interest formulas? You need to have both of those on your one page sheet of notes as well. It says here, find the, find the accumulated value of an investment of $10,000 for five years at an annual interest rate of 8% if the money is part A compounded quarterly and B compounded continuously. All right, so part A says compounded quarterly. Well, if something is compounded quarterly, how many compoundings are there in a single year? It'd be four. N is the number of compoundings, so N is going to be equal to four. That's for the first three months, second three months, the third three months, and the last three months in a year. Now, we have N number of compoundings, so we have to use the formula a is equal to P times the quantity 1 plus R divided by N raised to the N times T. That's the one we must use only for N number of compoundings. And by the way, 
let's identify what we already have in that problem. We have uh, an investment at $10,000, so that P is $10,000. Uh, for five years, that means T is equal to five. The annual interest rate is 8%. Now, what's 8% as a decimal? 0 0.08. And if you didn't know that, you can take the 8. Since percent means per 100, we divide by 100. 0 0.08 will give you the interest rate in decimal form. So let's substitute those values into this compound interest formula. So that means A is equal to P, which is uh, 10,000, times the quantity 1 plus R, that's 0 0.08, divided by N, which is uh, 4. That quantity will be raised to the N again, that's going to be 4, times T, which is 5. This you can just type directly into the calculator to get your answer. So this is going to be 10,000, and then left parentheses, 1 plus 0 0.08, divided by 4, close parentheses, press the hat key, 4 times 5, and then hit enter. Now, what would this amount be, since we're dealing with money amounts, what would this be to two decimal places? Correct. So that means the accumulated value of a $10,000 investment for five years at 8% compounded quarterly would be $14,859.47. All right, questions on part A. All right, now part B says compounded continuously. All right, in this case here. If it's compounded continuously, then that means we must use that other formula, and that's the one that has the natural base E in it. That's A is equal to P times E to the RT. So here A is equal to P, the principal, that's 10,000, times E to the R, that's going to be 0 0.08 times T, which is 5. Now that can be typed in the calculator as well. Type in 10,000, and then for the E, you do second LN for the E, then 0 0.08 times 5, and then press Enter. So what would this amount be to two decimal places? Twenty-five cents. So the accumulated value of a ten thousand dollar investment for five years at eight percent compounded continuously would be that amount fourteen thousand nine hundred eighteen dollars twenty-five cents. Are there any questions about problem seven? All right, in problem number eight, problem number eight, it says here to write the equation log to the base six of 216 equals y in its equivalent exponential form. Now, if you recall, I did give you a study tip to convert 
from logarithmic form to exponential form. And the way we do that is you start with the subscript for your log, which is this 6. What's after the equal sign or what's in front of the equal sign will be your exponent, since a logarithm, logarithm means the exponent. And then that's equal to the log of that number. Well, actually, the argument itself. So in exponential form, this will be 6 to the y power equals 216. Okay. Questions about problem number 8. That's all you have to do there. Just convert it to its equivalent exponential form. All right, number 9. You have the exponential form 7 to the power of y equals 200. And you want to convert that to its equivalent logarithmic form. Well, if you're going to convert any exponential uh, equation into its uh, logarithmic form, you must have LOG in it. The 7 is the base, so that's the subscript for the log. So it'll be log to the base 7 of this number that's after the equal sign. That's your argument, 200, equals that exponent, y. And you have to keep in mind that the logarithm means exponent. So 7 to the y equals 200 in logarith logarithmic form would be log to the base 7 of 200 equals y. Are there any questions about problem number 9? Number 10. Excuse me. All right, number 10 is to evaluate the expression log to the base 2 of 64. And it does say without the use of a calculator. But I know some of you, you're probably going to use a calculator anyway, so. Here's how we do this problem. What I would do here is take log to the base 2 of 64. Set that to be equal to some variable, which I'm going to call y. And then next I'll write this in its equivalent exponential form. Okay, so here that 2 is your subscript for your log. Your y will be your exponent, so it'll be 2 to the power of y equals 64. So we're looking for what value of y, where 2 to the power of y is equal to 64. Well, I already know that 64 is a multiple of 2. So let's write 64 as 2 to some power. So if I divide 2 into 64, that's going to go 32 times. Divide 2 again, this time into 32, that'll be 16. Divide 2 again into 16, that'll go 8. Divide 2 again into 8, that'll go 4 times. Divide 2 again into 4, that goes 2 times. 2 goes into itself one time. How many factors of 2 do I have here? 6. So 64 in exponential form would be 2 to the 6th power. So I have 2 to the y equals 2 to the 6. Now there's a rule that says if my bases are the same here, I can set this exponent to be equal to that exponent. So I can set y equal to 6. And that would be the exponent that I was looking for for log to the base 2 of 64. So log to the base 2 of 64 ends up being 6. Okay. Are there any questions about problem number 10? All right, 11, 12, and 13, you have to evaluate or simplify each expression without the use of a calculator. That's where we use those uh, 
inverse properties for common logarithms and also for natural logarithms as well. So in problem number 11, log to the base 10 of 7. Now, of course, if you remember, if you have log of 10 to whatever your exponent is, it will be that exponent because log to the base 10 and the base 10 are inverses. So what is log of 10 to the 7? 7. Okay, that's all there is to it, using this property of common logarithms. All right, number 12. ln of e to the ninth. And this is one of those inverse properties where if you have ln of e to whatever your exponent is, it will be that exponent. Because ln and e are inverses of each other. So what is ln of e to the ninth? Nine. Okay. And finally, number 13 is e to the ln of 7x cubed. And the other prop, inverse property of natural logarithms is this. e to the ln of whatever your argument is, is that argument. So what would ln of e to the 7, I mean e to the ln of 7x cubed be? 7x cubed. Okay, that shouldn't be that bad. All right, questions on 11, 12, and 13. Or are there any questions on what will be on your third exam?